Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Hudson Institute. My name is Adam Kuiper. I am the editor of the New Atlantis and its New Atlantis Books series, which is what brings us here tonight, the latest book in that series. Uh, before beginning and saying a word about our speaker and about the book, I'd like to thank uh, some of our partners in uh, publishing and bringing this event and the book to you. I'd like to thank the Ethics and Public Policy Center, the Witherspoon Institute, the Bradley Foundation, and Encounter Books. I'd uh, also especially like to thank the Hudson Institute for hosting us this evening, and its Bradley Center for Philanthropy and Civic Renewal. Uh, among the Bradley, the, the Hudson Institute staff, I'd like to thank uh, Perry Farbstein, Kristen McIntyre, Grace Terzian, and Jamie Bologna. And I'd like to single out also Bill Chambra, uh, whose research on the role of major philanthropic foundations in supporting the eugenics uh, movement of a century ago deserves wide attention uh, and ought to encourage, frankly, some real soul searching in the halls of several major American philanthropies. I'd also like to thank my extraordinary staff uh, at the New Atlantis, Catherine Nickel, Ari Schulman, Brendan Fote, and our army of interns, some of whom are here now, who over the past year uh, helped us with the fact-checking, the editing, and all the other required work on this book. Uh, and uh, I'd like to just have three uh, short administrative notes first. If you have a cell phone or any other noise-making device, I'd invite you to silence it now. Second, uh, after tonight's lecture, there's going to be a Q&A. Uh, Robert Zubrin will take some questions. We'll have a microphone going around, uh, and before you ask your question, please identify yourself and wait for the microphone to reach you. And finally, after the Q&A, there will be a wine and cheese reception. Some of you, I can see, have already hit the wine and cheese now. That's just fine. It may pair you better. Uh, as uh, our friend Noemi Emery said, uh, nothing helps despair go down better than some wine and cheese. Our speaker tonight, Robert Zubrin, is best known for his commentary on and advocacy of space exploration. He is the best known and most widely respected supporter of the human exploration of the planet Mars. And after developing a technical proposal for affordably sending manned missions to the red planet, he founded the Mars Society in 1998. His best-selling book, The Case for Mars, was published in 1996 and a brand new edition just came out last year from Simon & Schuster. Mr. Zubrin, or I should call him Dr. Zubrin, or he has a PhD in nuclear engineering, uh, in addition to master's degrees in aeronautics and astronautics, uh, has written several other books on space exploration and runs his own uh, consulting company, a, a, a space company actually, called Pioneer Astronautics out in Colorado. Dr. Zubrin several years ago began to turn his attention to energy policy. His 2007 book, Energy Victory, uh, made a conservative case for ethanol and other biofuels. So if it's a conservative arguing for ethanol, you can see that he has no qualms about challenging established opinion. So too with the subject tonight. We're pleased tonight to offer Robert Zubrin's first public talk on his new book, Merchants of Despair, Radical Environmentalists, criminal pseudoscientists, and the fatal cult of anti-humanism. Anti-humanism. Dr. Zubrin makes the case that an ideological threat, anti-humanism, can be seen weaving through such disparate projects as the eugenics movement of a century ago to the population control movement to today's radical green movement. The book brings together historical interpretation, scientific analysis, sociological criticism, and some good old-fashioned fun polemicizing. It makes a powerful case, and Dr. Zubrin, I think you'll agree, is an engaging speaker, so strap yourselves in. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Zubrin. Uh, thank you, Adam, for that kind introduction, and uh, thanks again to both the Ethics and Public Policy Center and the Hudson Institute, Bradley Foundation, for uh, making this event possible. And to all of you for turning out to hear what I have to say, uh, because this is a very important subject and uh, your interest in it and, and interest in wanting to deal with the, these matters is, is 
critical. So uh, I'm going to talk about anti-humanism as a thread which unites a variety of movements, as Adam mentioned, uh, over the past 200 years. Uh, it undoubtedly goes back further, but I'm going to begin with uh, Malthus as the seminal uh, thinker who put its axioms together upon which its various later variants are all uh, in one way or another based. Now, uh, I do not mean in, in, in showing how these things link together to allege that this is a 200-year-old conspiracy. Uh, it is a movement. Uh, it is uh, a set of ideas. Uh, there are various uh, points in it in, in certain places and times when there are groups advocating it, it, which can be fairly described as conspiracies. But for the most part, uh, it's a broad movement. Uh, sometimes it's involved whole political parties. Sometimes it's just individuals all actuated by a common uh, set of ideas. And ultimately, it's these ideas themselves that, that are uh, the villain of the piece um, because they uh, have morphed. They put on left-wing costumes, right-wing costumes. They have varied for everything from feminism to militarism, from laissez-faire capitalism to communism um, and anti-communism, um, as a matter of fact, as, as you'll see. But there's an underlying thread in all of them that is simply putting on different uh, costumes that make it fashionable for whatever environment it's attempting to sell itself in. Um, so let's start with Malthus. Okay. Uh, you know, population expands geometrically. Food supply expands arithmetically. Therefore, population will always outrun food supply, and therefore the population should be swept from the land as he said, referring in this case to Ireland. Um, the, now, uh, Malthus himself was not a disinterested party. Malthus was an employee of the British East India Company, and the theory was largely a rationalization for the starvation conditions that were being created in, the East, uh, in India by the company and its administration of, of that colony. Uh, and subsequently in the 19th century, uh, the Malthusian theory was used to justify uh, the famines, so-called, in Ireland. You see over here from a contemporary illustration. And uh, India, this is 1876. Uh, in both cases, students of Malthus were in charge. Um, Trevelyan in Ireland in the 1840s, uh, Bulwer Lytton in uh, India in the 1870s. Uh, and, uh, and they prevented relief, actually, uh, saying it would do no good. Uh, uh, Florence Nightingale protested the extremely harsh taxation policies that the British were imposing on India in the midst of this famine, and she was answered by the administration, it will do no good to lift these taxes, they'll simply multiply more. Okay, so there you have it, and, uh, and there's more that can be said about this, but uh, we'll move on for now. Now, the, the, the main thing I want to say at this point is the theory is totally false. The theory that human well-being is inversely proportional to human numbers is simply false, as proven by the historical data. Okay, so for instance, here, what we see, this graph uh, shows, uh, okay, the populate, this is from uh, 1500 to the year 2000, okay, and we've got a population going up, we've got gross domestic product, this is global gross domestic product per capita, going up. In other words, as population grows up, standard of living goes up. It doesn't go down. Okay? And this has been an invariant through human history. Now, if we were to take uh, an example of a, a very recent and well-known Malthusian, uh, who we will talk a little bit more about later, Paul Ehrlich. Okay, he wrote the book The Population Bomb in 1968. It was a runaway bestseller. It was promoted on the Johnny Carson show, everything. And, okay, he said the world population is going to double by the year 2000. It's 3.5 billion now. It's going to be 7 billion then. We've got starving people now. They're going to be starving in the streets then. And, and, and he urged, in fact, the Johnson administration to withhold famine aid to India unless they impose forced sterilization programs, which, which they did. Uh, Indira, Indira Gandhi capitulated to this pressure, and, and they did. They rounded up millions of women and, they, and men, and they forcibly sterilized them. Uh, it, it, 
and, and furthermore, he even said that the U.S. should create a Bureau of Population that would, uh, you'd have to get a permit from the federal government if you wanted to have a child. Okay, this is a one-child policy, which fortunately was not adopted here, but was adopted in China uh, with horrific results, as we'll discuss. But to get back to the point, he said world population is going to double by the year 2000, and therefore standard of living is going to collapse. Well, he was close to being right about world population doubled by the year 2000. It doubled um, relative to 1968 and 2010. All right, that's pretty good. Uh, but did the standard of living collapse? No. Okay, the uh, GDP per capita in 1968, uh, global GDP per capita was a little less than $4,000 a year. Now it's about $8,000 a year. It doubled. The world population doubled and the GDP per capita doubled. So he was completely wrong. Well, everybody's got the right to be wrong about predicting the future. But he was also wrong about predicting the past. 